Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the, or stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Welcome to Wednesday night, Deliverance Bible Church, Word Alive time. This is our Bible study time. And we're grateful to God for allowing us to be here tonight. We're grateful to God for allowing you to be with us tonight. If this is a return for you, we thank God for you coming back. We, we think that possibly you return because you have been receiving something from the Word of God that's helping you in life. If this is your first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome you here. And we're glad that you came to be with us tonight. Hey, while you're here... Push that button, whatever that thing is on your Facebook, that share uh, button, whatever it is. Send somebody else a message that Deliverance Bible Church is on Wednesday Night Bible Study. Word Live, we call it, uh, that you might share with them what I'm sharing with you. See, that's supposed to be the process. That's how it's supposed to be that God says what we receive, we should all also share. So as you're receiving the word of God, you should always also want somebody else to receive the word of God also. And listen, yes, it's good that you tell them about it, but it's good also that they get to hear it uh, themselves, okay, on this broadcast. So hit it right now, whatever you need to do, share it, do watch party, whatever that stuff is that you need to do uh, to let somebody else know that delivers Bible Church, <clears throat> Bible study time. And we are on the air trying to bring us a word uh, of God, out of the Word of God, a word from God, out of the Word of God. What a great day it's been. It's, it's a little chilly, y'all, in my area. It's, 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 it's getting a little cool outside, so Mama and you used to say, you know, don't be out there trying to be cute, trying to put some coats on, some caps or hats on or something, because the weather has changed. It's not spring. It's not summer. Fall has failed, and it's, it's starting to almost feel like winter out there. They're talking about some areas of the country got snow already, and they're talking about how cold it's going to get in our area uh, by this weekend. So wrap up, tighten up, time to be cute, and all that other stuff. Cut that loose now. Use some, some common thinking about going outside because it's chilly outside, but we thank God that even though it might be chilly outside, he warms our hearts. And he keeps us by his Holy Spirit and by his word. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. God, we're thankful for the day. Your love and kindness is better than life. And you brought us and kept us. And for that, we give you praise. God, we pray that uh, those who are looking in tonight, that you're going to help them. You're going to help them. You're going to help us tonight, God, in your, in your word, God. Uh, a word that we need, a word that we need to be aware of and, and, and how the enemy comes against us, God. Equip us now that we will be more ready for how the enemy comes against us and we will know how to resist him. God, I pray tonight that you would help me. Uh, I hide, God, behind you. I decrease that you might increase in me tonight. I want the words of my mouth, God, and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. So I need your help tonight. I uh, pray that you would edify your people and glorify your name. We bless you now and we lift you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, amen. Listen, we're going to go right in. Uh, we spent the last few weeks, we spent the last few weeks uh, talking about the whole armor of God. We, we talked about that from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10 through verse uh, 18. Uh, about the armor that God has equipped us with because we are in a spiritual warfare. We're in a war, uh, but it's spiritual warfare. So we, we walk through that passage with the different parts of the armor that God, it's his armor that he's equipped us with to be victorious in this battle. So uh, with that tonight, I, I want to uh, talk about this subject matter, kind of hitchhiking on that from a different passage of scripture. I want to talk about victory in obedience victory in obedience if you're going to see the victory that god has already granted you it's important that you see it through obedience that is doing what god has called us to do and we're going to try to show you tonight 
uh, in our text tonight. Let me give you the main idea, and it is I must be determined to discipline my mind and thoughts. I must be determined to discipline my mind and thoughts, and hopefully that will come clear to you as we go through tonight. So uh, let's go in. Uh, go into your Bibles, your devices, or whatever it is, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to look at some issues here that Paul brings out uh, about disciplining the mind and, and the thoughts. Um, uh, in the first two verses, if you would, uh, Paul, ta he says, he's pleading with you by meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold, with that confidence, which I tend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Let me just give you a little background on that. Um, uh, much of Second Corinthians, I think we mentioned it before, is, is, is about correction, even more correction. And Paul, uh, many parts, Paul had to defend himself. Um, there were those who came behind him and uh, really practiced character assassination on him. They, uh, they brought up some things against Paul to discredit him. And if they could discredit him, they could discredit his teaching. And they, they, uh, they, uh, they accused him of having self-motivated uh, uh, ideas. He, he was self-serving ideas, self-serving uh, motives, okay? And so uh, they brought these things against Paul. Paul, and, and apparently, apparently there were those who, uh, some who wrote to Paul. This is out of an answer of some things that they had concern, were concerned about to Paul. And Paul was answering back uh, about these false teachers, these teachers who came in behind Paul and want to mess up what he had taught. So Paul had to write back to them uh, to tell them, um, um, uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Do you know how I've been uh, with you? You know how I've been uh, when I was there. And so uh, I'm concerned about you allowing um, you allowing these false teachers to spread this stuff about me. I'm concerned about that. So um, in, in writing this letter, writing this part, he says, you know, he says, I'm, I'm sending you, I'm talking to you about this in this letter. I'm being bold towards you in the letter. You know that when I was with you, I was in meekness and gentleness of Christ, but now that these things have come up that I've heard about, there's a boldness now. This is a, a, a more forceful Paul, if you would, now. And I'm writing you this letter so that you, you would pay attention and get these things in order so that when I come to you, I can come to you again by meekness and gentleness and not boldness. In other words, pay heed to what I'm saying to you. Work on what I'm saying to you so I won't have to say it to you when I come back. Uh, this is kind of like, I think, uh, I think, you know, sometimes you might have to, you might take your car in, you might take your car in or whatever to uh, get it repaired or whatever. And when you, when you, you pay for it and you, you get back home and something and something's wrong or whatever, they didn't get it right. So what do you do? You call them, you call them and you, this is what you tell them. You tell them something's wrong with my car. You tell them you expect them to fix it. You know, you, you kind of, you're bold on that phone. You tell them you didn't, you, you shouldn't have to go through this. You paid them and you shouldn't have to go through this. You're real bold on the phone when you're talking to them. And you, what you tell them is that I want to bring my car back. And I expect that when I bring my car back, you're going to take care of the problem. So they make notes or whatever. And the issue is you want to make sure they get it on the phone. Listen to this. So you don't have to repeat yourself when you get back to the dealership. Okay. You don't want to have to tell, repeat at the dealership what you said to them on the phone. And what you expect then is when you get to the dealership, they said, oh, yes, Mr. Jackson, we got the notes here from what you said need to be done. Uh, give us the keys. Um, do, you, do you need to ride home or you want to wait? Whatever, okay, because they already got it. This is the idea with Paul is that I want you to take notice of what I'm saying to you now. And take care of it now so that when I come back, I don't have to be this way when I come back because I want to be meek and gentle. As a matter of fact, by the way, make sure that when you call them to tell them uh, that something's wrong with your car, make sure you do it in a crash-like manner. E even though you're being bold, don't be ugly. 
You can be bold, but you don't have to be ugly. Don't be ugly on people. You can state your point. You can, you can let them know that you don't like what happened, but you don't have to be ugly on people, okay? That's just for somebody out there tonight. So, so, so Paul writes to them, um, and so what he wants them to understand really is uh, uh, that those who were attacking him, coming up saying that uh, they were questioning his motives, uh, he wants them to understand that the root of the attack is spiritual. This is what he wants them to understand, that these false teachers that were coming after him, uh, talking about him, if, the, if you would, because a lot of ways people go after people is by talking about them, to discredit them, to put them down, to um, assassinate their character. A lot of it is talking. He wanted them to understand that the root of the issue of the attack attack is spiritual. Uh, why do we need to catch this, okay? Because when the enemy comes after you today, the root of the attack is spiritual. Listen, he might use people, okay? Uh, and he might use people in a persuasive manner. We'll, we'll see that perhaps in just a, a few minutes. You know, it, it might not always be just an ugly, ugly thing on you. It's just per, words being used to persuade others against you, perhaps, or whatever it might be. The root of that is is spiritual. So the problem that Paul faced with the church at Corinth. It's the same problem that we as believers face today is that he was in a war uh, by those coming after him, uh, but they, the ones who were coming after him were motivated by the enemy, the devil. We need to get that. We talked about that. I'm going to say that in just a minute. So we need to understand that when stuff is coming after us, it is the enemy and we have to be aware of how he comes. He, we be aware of how he comes. So when you get... When you get to verses 3 and 4, I just want to highlight verses 1 and 2. When you get to verses 3 and 4, here's a reminder. Here's a reminder. The war that we face is spiritual in nature. Here's a reminder. I've been talking about this for a few weeks now. Okay. Uh, what's being said, what comes after one's person, what, uh, you as a person, whatever, the root of it. Uh, the war is spiritual in nature. As we spent time going through the whole armor of God, Ephesians, we try to keep emphasizing that what you see uh, has a, a, a spiritual root to it. What you see has a spiritual root to it coming at you. Um, so the war that we face is spiritual in nature. This is your reminder. Okay, look at what he says. He says, um, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We are human. We walk in the flesh. We are human. But the war that we are in is not really a human war because it's spiritual. Listen to what he says. For the weapons of our warfare. Listen, he uses it again. The weapons of our warfare. Well, what's warfare about? It's about a struggle. It's about two sides vying for victory. Whenever you have war, you have two sides basically set against each other. And the one side, both sides are, are in the war for victory. They want to uh, overcome the other side. They contend. There's a, there's a struggle, if you would. And, uh, at, at one point, I think it was, uh, I believe it was in Galatians, Paul said that the flesh wrestles against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a struggle going on. It's, it's a war. So he says, he says, the weapons of our warfare, the weapons, the things that we use in this warfare, listen to this. So therefore, since it's a spiritual war, we don't use of the things of the world to fight in this war. Remember, we talked about the whole armor of God earlier. We, it, we had spiritual application to that armor because it's spiritual warfare. Listen, it's two sides vying for victory. Listen to this. Now, we said before that um, our victory is already finished in Christ Jesus. In other words, in the war, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. We're fighting from victory because we have victory in Jesus. But listen to this. What the enemy wants to do is he wants to keep you from walking in what Jesus has already done. That's what he wants. 
you are already victorious, but the enemy doesn't want you to see the victory. So he will do what he can, warfare, to keep you from walking in what Jesus Christ has already has already done. So he says the weapon of our warfare uh, 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 are not carnal, but mighty in God. This is about our spiritual, our spiritual weapons for the spiritual warfare. They're mighty in God. So notice, notice now, the weapons that we have are not carnal. They're not about the physical thing. They're spiritual and they're mighty in God. Again, it's, it's what God has given us. Remember when you go to war, you don't go to war on your own. You don't go to war and you supply your own weapons in the military. Those of you who are in the military, you remember that uh, uh, in your, your, your training or whatever it was in your boot camp or whatever they're calling it today, your school, your training, they supplied you with the weapons and you had, listen, you had to learn how to use them. They taught you how to use them, to break them down, to clean them, to put them back together. You had to learn how to use them, but they provided the weapons that they saw fit for you to use when they were preparing you for war. Listen, the weapons that we have that we use in this war are mighty in God because it's God who supplies them. It's God who supplies the spiritual weapons for this spiritual war. And listen to what he says. For pulling down strongholds. I, I, I got to stop right there. For, for pulling down, for casting down strongholds. What, what's a stronghold here? Um, let me give you a couple things here. First of all, it's any strong point or argument in which one trusts. Now remember, remember this. The false teachers were coming against Paul. So they were arguing, arguing, I'm sorry, against Paul. Okay. So they, they, were, they were strong points is, is what they were try, trying to do here. And they, listen to this, they were trusting in what they were saying was going to affect the people. See, what the enemy does is he wants to bring things to you and he's trusting in this. Listen to this. He's trusting in that what he's going to bring to you will convince you. That's what he's after. He wants to convince you. So uh, strongholds, uh, strong fortresses. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, fortresses, strongholds are difficult to overcome. You know, fortresses, strongholds, that's a military term. Okay, and so they're difficult to overcome. So the enemy comes, he comes with with arguments, if you would. He he comes, he he comes uh, with strong points and 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 he wants to convince you that his points are right. OK, he doesn't want you to overcome his points. He wants his points, if you would, to be set at, up, up as a stronghold, as a fortress. And what he would really like to do is he wants to overcome you, not have you overcome what he's bringing to you. OK, he wants he wants to convince you that he is just right. Anyhow, you ever have. <laughs> You ever known people in your life that are right no matter what? People who are right no matter what, I'm just saying that add to, they're strong. They're strong in their arguments and they won't release it. They, they built up a fortress against whatever you have to say. No matter what you say, they're going to be right anyhow. Okay, that, that's a stronghold. That's a fortress. It's been built up. They built, they built this up. And no matter what you might say, no matter how you might try to reason with them, they're not budging. Well, the enemy wants to come to you with stuff. He wants to get you to budge to him. In other words, he's going to be strong in what he has to say. He's going to be strong in the argument. And so him coming strong in the argument is him trying to get you to come over to where he wants you where he wants you to be strongholds, strongholds. And he deals with strongholds in your life. That's some, that's why, listen, that's why so many times when you, when you consider this, uh, we'll get to this later, but consider this, why is it so hard to break a habit? Why is it so hard to, to break something that you know is not good for you? Because it's become a stronghold and it's difficult to overcome. It's got embedded and it's hard to get it out. 
And so it's in your mind, it's in your will, it's in everything that this is it. This is the way it is. You can't get away from this. You can't get over this because it's been embedded by the enemy. So he wants to embed stuff. He wants to come against you with thoughts, with arguments to embed stuff to become a stronghold. And he wants that to become a part of your life. He's not giving in to you. He wants you to give in to it. Okay. So, so the review, that was the review. The review was, the review was uh, that we're, we face that the war we are in is spiritual in nature. As those false teachers were coming against Paul in the spiritual realm to discredit him, to defame his name, to commit character assassination on him, the enemy is going to come against you also. You and I, you a child of God. And the enemy comes against you now because you are a child of God, okay? Listen, let's move on. Let's move on. So we got the we got the reminder, we got the reminder in, in verse uh verses verse four here, uh three and four, that it's it's spiritual. This is a spiritual thing. By nature, it's a spiritual thing. So when you get to verse five, when you get to verse five, we 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 we're still in dealing with the thoughts in here. Verse 5, the enemy wants to introduce thoughts that lead to behavior contrary to God's will. This, this is the whole purpose. This, this is the whole purpose of why he comes after you. This is the whole purpose of why he comes after me. He wants to introduce thoughts. Remember arguments? He wants to introduce thoughts that lead to a behavior to, that's contrary to God's will. Look what he says. He said, this, this is what we have to do. This is what you need to be aware of, okay? The weapons of our warfare uh, are, are not according to the flesh. They are our warfare, uh, but they are, here it is. This is what we do. We cast down arguments. We have to cast down, pull down, or destroy arguments. Arguments. These are, these are, these are speculations of the mind that precede and precede and determine conduct. This, this is what arguments are. They are speculations of the mind. When you, when you, when you, their point of view, their perspective that wants to have its way. Okay. Because once the perspective, once the speculation of the mind has its way, it now can determine conduct. It can, can determine conduct. It, and listen to this, listen to this, this is what he's after. Uh, he wants to build, he wants to build in you as a believer, destructive patterns of thought, destructive patterns of thought. And what he wants to do is lead you away from following God. You, you're a soldier in the army of the Lord. <laughs> okay. You got your war clothes on in the army of the Lord. Okay. Uh, got your sword and your shield in the army of the Lord. But what the enemy wants to do is he wants to raise speculations in your mind. He wants to raise arguments in your mind. Listen to this. And you've got to be able to pull, cast those arguments down. In other words, he, instead of you understanding and seeing what God says, he wants you to accept his point of view. View. He wants you to accept his point of view. Arguments, speculations, all kinds of things that he will throw at you. He will throw at your, your mind and they can be destructive patterns of thought. Um, your, your, your lifestyle can become a destruct for you, a destructive uh, pattern of life because he wants to lead you uh, astray. And once he leads you astray, he wants to hold you hostage. He's really after holding you hostage. And it could be sinful, harmful, and addictive behavior, but he wants to hold you hostage by, by li listen to this, by, by dominating your thinking. The enemy wants to dominate your thinking because if he can dominate your thinking, he can also influence your conduct. Remember, whatever dominates your thinking shows up in your conduct. And that's what he's after. Okay, you belong to God. He can't have you. He can't have you. 
But what he wants to do is he wants to dominate your thinking to control your conduct so you could be a soldier in the army of the Lord and you could do all that other stuff and you could be led astray by the thinking of the enemy because if you're just singing it, if you're just singing it, he doesn't mind you singing it. He just don't want you to live it. He wants you to sing songs and be detached from the songs that you sing. He don't want you to live that way. And the way he comes at you is by introducing things thoughts that can lead to destructive patterns of behavior and listen to this you won't even recognize it you won't even recognize it because remember this whatever whenever the enemy introduces something to you he never introduces it at a way that you recognize it's not good for you he tries to convince you that this is the best for you he tries to convince you that he's looking out for your good, okay? But in the long run, he's trying to set you up to bring you down. That is what he is, is after. Let, let, let me see. Um, um, let, let me see if I can do it this way with Paul. Paul talking to Timothy over 2 Timothy 4, um, uh, starting at verse 2. First start, uh, 2 Timothy 4, starting at verse 2. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when men will, when they will not endure sound doctrine, sound, sound doctrine, doctrine that is, is sound, doctrine that is sound. It's interesting because that word sound there, uh, that word sound there is uh, from, uh, derived from the, the Greek word from which we get our word hygiene, hygiene, cleanliness, sound doctrine, clean, has to do with cleanliness, okay? They, they won't endure doctrine that will keep them, keep them moving the way God wants them to move, cleanliness and how God wants them to live, okay? But now watch this. But according to their own desires, this is why you got to check your desires, they, because they have itching ears, listen, He's not teaching what they want to hear, so their ears itch. And you know what happens when you when you have an itch. You know what you want to do? You want you want to scratch it because scratching makes it sound better, feel better. So he says they have itching ears. They look for a heap unto themselves teachers. They're looking for teachers. Listen to this. They're looking for teachers that will agree with what they want to hear what they want to hear. They're looking for teachers that will bring in arguments that agree with what they want to be in life, okay? And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to, to fables, speculations, perspectives contrary to God, fables, and they can be led astray because here's the thing. Here's what the enemy wants to do. Listen to this. The enemy wants to present stuff to you that sounds good and makes sense. And, and many times, that's how we do life. It, it, it sounds good and it makes sense, but what we don't catch is it sounds good because that's what we want to hear. What we want to hear will always sound good. <laughs> okay, It makes sense because it agrees with where the enemy is taking us. So what we want to hear, listen, it sounds good, but listen to this, it's not sound. It sounds good, but it is not sound. Okay? You can't lean on it. You can't depend on it. It sounds good. And so what the enemy does, and this is why we have to pull it down, is the enemy wants to introduce, listen, thoughts, speculations uh, of the mind. And he doesn't want us to be aware that these speculations and these thoughts that he introduces in, into the mind, okay, can lead us astray. That's why we, he says we cast them down. We cast down arguments, okay? We pull them down. These, these things that the enemy is trying to set up in my mind, I can't let them stay there. I got to pull them down. I've got to cast them down. I've got to practice discernment. I need the help of the Spirit here to practice discernment because everything that sounds good, listen to this, 
everything that sounds good is not necessarily good and we end up agreeing with the wrong thing we end up agreeing with the wrong thing you got to be careful that you don't end up agreeing with the wrong thing sounding good and making sense don't mean that is right i say that again because it sounds good and it makes sense doesn't necessarily mean that it is right. Okay? So now watch then. Watch then now. Listen to this. Listen. Watch this. The enemy wants to introduce thoughts that lead to behavior contrary to God's will. This is what he's after. This is what he this is. What he, so, so we have to cast down, cast down arguments. Casting down arguments. Now look at the rest of that verse. This is the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse. And everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yeah. See, we have to have the discernment to understand that even though this stuff sounds good and it makes sense, the the end result is that it's exalting itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is is raised up. See, it's raised up in your mind. What the enemy wants to do is raise up in your mind, okay? Uh, arguments, speculations that exalt themselves against the knowledge, against the knowledge of God. Listen, let me let me throw a few of these out here. False ideas about God, false doctrine, false teaching. <laughs> Here's one: false reasoning, reasoning. Okay, uh, human pride, arrogance, self sufficiency, exalts uh, self righteousness. Okay. All these things exalt themselves against a knowledge of God. And what, what they do is they take you away from, or they are contrary, if you would, to the will of God. I, just today, just today, um, I, was a, I came in, I was a show on, and they, were, they had a, a, a actor, I guess it was an actor, I don't know, I'd never heard the name before, but uh, during this pandemic, this pandemic time, uh, she had wrote a, um, she had wrote a book, uh, a book for her, for her daughter, I think it was. And uh, really what she had did in the book is she had changed. It was, I can't remember if it was the, uh, 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 if it was the Three Little Pigs, I can't remember what, but she had did some new, uh, some gender neutralizing, some gender switching, if you would. Uh, for as long as I known the Three Pigs, the wolf was a, was a man. So she made, he was a male, she made the wolf a female. So she did, did some gender switching stuff along the way. And uh, so uh, they, were, they were talking to her about the book and they, really what they were talking about was, uh, um, it, it, was, it, was it was bringing confusing, confusing, confusing to kids. It was bringing, making them confused, if you will. She was talking about, she was, was going to tell her child. She was going to let her child define herself. She was going to let her child define herself. She, she was not pushing male nor female. It was what, it was kind of like what they feel like. Okay. What they feel like. And so, uh, those who were interviewing her, interviewing her were saying, you know, that that's good. Cause you know, they're, they're doing that in school today and stuff. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the gender thing that, you know, the, you, you, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to accept. Here's what it was. You don't have to accept what the doctor said you were. You, you, you don't have to accept what the doctor said you were when you were born. Okay. That, that basically what it was. Okay. And so we've got this going on around now. And I'm, I'm talking about arguments and speculations. We've got this going on around now around us that, uh, you don't have to accept what the doctor said you were when you were born. You can, you can determine what you are. This is gender stuff here. You can be your gender. Your, your gender is not defined by your 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 organs that you came out with your gender is not defined by your sexual organs that you came out with that was the, a way the doctor find you know the doctor did not define you that way okay god defined you that way when you were in your mother's womb god defined if you would be male or female in your mother's womb it was not what the doctor as the doctor defined you as the doctor when you came out just confirmed what you were in your mother's womb but you see, you got to understand because this is going on now, there are people who are accepting, who are accepting this, this, this idea and many others. And what these ideas do is they exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. I hope somebody's hearing me tonight. 
They exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And what helps it to go on is that uh, you've got medical profession, you've got the psychologist, you've got a, this whole different groups of professionals who are buying into this thing. So it's becoming now acceptable behavior. It's becoming, if you would, acceptable thinking that you you don't have to be the way you were born. You don't have to accept that. Be what you feel like you're going to be. Was I want to tell you, your feelings will mess you up. One, one of the things, especially when the enemy knows this, that your feelings can lead you astray. That's why we as believers, we have to, we have to act more on what we know as far as the word says and less on our feelings. This is why we must know the word of God. We, we, you, you know, when we talked about the whole armor of God and we tried to walk through the word of God, showing the whole armor of God, because it's not how man defines you. It's not how you define yourself. It's how God defines you in his word. And the enemy will introduce thoughts that lead to behavior lead to behavior that is contrary to God's will. So even though you are saved, he will try to get you to buy into what we're hearing today on the airwaves, on TV, the books that are being written, radio, music, that are trying to lead you into a direction that's contrary to the will of God. And these things want to, these thoughts, these ideas, want to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. You, you've got to know the truth. Jesus, when, when he was praying, uh, the high priestly prayer in John 17 and 17, he got to a point where he was talking to God about his disciples. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. We must know the truth because if you don't know the truth, you're going to believe the lie because the devil knows how to take the lie and make it sound good. He knows how to twist it. He, makes, he, he knows how to make it make sense. He knows how to make it appealing to you. And if you don't know the word, if you don't understand what God has said about you in the word and how he wants you to live in his word, then that stuff can become a part of you. And Paul says we're in a spiritual war and that stuff that comes along, those arguments that come along, that we've got to cast them down. we got to pull them down because they're trying to exalt themselves against a knowledge, a knowledge of God. Um, I, I, I told this, uh, this, this, uh, this story to our men several times uh, that um, years ago, years ago, um, when Promise Keepers was, was, uh, when Promise Keepers was going strong, they had had a, a pastor's conference in Atlanta. And so a bunch of us went down from Tacoma. You know, they, they invited pastors to come down and they, they scholarshiped us. They scholarshiped us uh, to try to help us to come down. And... Uh, after the conference was over, uh, coming back home on the plane, uh, I was sitting, uh, uh, it was, uh, I can't remember how big the plane was, but I was sitting on the, on the three row side. It might have been three and a two, but I was, and I was sitting in the outside, uh, in the outside seat, and there were two guys, you know, sitting, sitting over in, inside next to me, and they were talking, and they were talking about God. They were, they were going back and forth about God. Now, this was their conversation, okay? This was their conversation. I was trying to do some stuff. You know, I was trying to get ready to come back because, uh, you know, preaching Sunday was coming, you know, so I was trying to get ready. And uh, so I was really reading the stuff, you know, And but as they were talking, I kind of leaned over a little bit. I didn't want to go get into the conversation, but they were talking back and forth about God and, and this, that, and the other. And come to find out, one of them, the one in the middle seat was a pastor. The one on the inside seat called himself a Jeffersonian Christian. I had never heard that term before then. I didn't know. Apparently, somewhere along the line, Thomas Jefferson had 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 uh, wrote his own translation of the Bible, something along those lines. And he had uh, apparently he had some erroneous teaching. He had some erroneous teaching, uh, you know. And and so these guys were talking back and forth. And so finally, the guy in the middle seat looked at me, and he said, "What do you think?" He he asked me that because they were going back and forth. They couldn't settle nothing. He said, "What do you think?" And I said, "Well, actually." I said, you know, you, you're having a conversation about God, but you're not having the conversation about God from what God has said about himself. See, they were talking, but they were there were no scriptures, nothing. They were just talking back and forth. And so I said, was well, if you're going to talk about God, 
If you're going to talk about God, you've got to talk about God from his word because that's where he has showed us what he is all about. So I was able to turn the conversation, okay, because they were talking. And the one guy, the Jeffersonian Christian, he was really talking from speculations and stuff that, that, that uh, uh, you know, that just went on. So it was just, they was going back and forth. So I, I got a chance to talk to them. And so what I did was... Um, as he was talking, the Jeffersonian Christian was talking, I, I had to, I had to, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk, I really want to talk about Jesus, but I had to be careful not to turn him off. So, so, um, so as we talked, um, uh, he said Jesus was a great prophet. It's what he said. He said Jesus was a great prophet. And he jumped over, I'm, I'm taking time to do this. Y'all stay with me for a minute. He, he, he went over to, he, he invited himself into John chapter uh, 14. He said, well, Jesus said that, in his house, there were many mansions there. He said, now, the word mansions mean prophets. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. So I gave him my Bible, okay, the one I had with me, and I had him turn to John uh, uh, 14, and he began reading it. He said, that means prophets. I said, well, what do you mean it means prophets? He said, well, that means there's prophets. What he said to me, that means there's many ways to Christ, many mansions, many prophets, many ways to God. I'm sorry, not many ways to Christ, many ways to God. That's what he said to me. I said, really now? He said, yeah. He said, yeah, you know, there's many prophets. There's many ways to God, is what he said to me. I said, okay, okay, good. I said, uh, so I began to question him because now he, what he was talking from, he's talking from speculations. He's talking from, from arguments. He's talking from a point of view, okay? So what I said to him, tell me, I said, did Jesus tell the truth all the time? He said, yeah. He said, sometimes Jesus said what he knew the hearers wanted to hear, but he always told the truth, which is a speculation. He didn't, he said what they want to hear. He always told the truth, but he didn't just say what they wanted to hear. A lot of folk got upset with him when he said what he said, because it was true. Anyway, I said, but so, so Jesus told the truth all the time. Can we agree on that? I said, Jesus never lied. He said, no, he never lied. I said, Jesus told the truth all the time. He said, yes, Jesus told the truth all the time. I said, so if Jesus said it, it was true. He said, yes, if Jesus said it, it was the truth. So I said, okay, this is Jesus talking here in, in, in John chapter 14. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, okay, read verse six. And he looked at it and it said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but, but by me. And he, he didn't say that. I said, now you said to me, Jesus always told the truth, right? He said, yeah, Jesus always told the truth. I said, so you said that many mansions meant many prophets, which meant there were many ways to God. He said, yeah, I said that. I said, well, now you just read and you just agree with me that Jesus always told the truth. He said, yeah, he did. I said, so what you just read, Jesus said the only way to the Father is by him. And he he looked at, literally, y'all, this is true. He looked at it again. He, he looked at it again, and he took the Bible that I gave him, and he turned it over. He looked at the outside, you know, the back of it. He looked at it like he had never seen nothing like that before. And as he looked at it, I, I now saw, and it was the power of the Spirit, I now saw that his mind was turning because what he read, listen to this, what he read in the word of God was contrary to what he had been taught, okay? So as he looked at it, I said, would you like to have it? And he said, yes. I said, fine, you keep it. You keep it. And I, and I, I'm, hopefully, maybe I'll see him in heaven. I don't know his name. I can't even tell you what he looked like now. But I do know that in that conversation, there was speculation. Okay, there, there were patterns of thought. And this pattern of thought that he had picked up uh, from the Jeffersonian Bible had not led him to God. It had led him away from God. And God, I believe that God, by divine appointment on that day, when I got on that plane, I thought I was going to sit down and I was going to do some stuff to get ready for Sunday. He had, God had something different in mind because God wanted that guy that was sitting one one seat over from me, 
he needed to be confronted with the truth of his word because he was believing speculations. He, what he was believing was not about God. This stuff that he had learned from the Jeffersonian Bible had exalted itself against a knowledge of God. This is why you got to know the truth. This is why you got to live in God's truth. Jesus said, Jesus said, because if you don't live in God's truth, you're living in a lie. And let me tell you what the outworking of lies are. Lies in the devil are about bondage. A lie can keep you in bondage. Believing what is not true can keep you in what is not true and you can be in bondage. You can be in bondage and not even know it because you agreeing with something that you've heard and you don't know, since you don't know the truth, you will fall for the lie and therefore you will live your life according to that lie. This is why you got to have the word. We were just in conversation last night in our men's Zoom meeting. And before we close, a brother asked a question. Somebody has said something to him. And when he asked the question, I could see the faces on the other brothers on the Zoom. Like say, why? Okay. So I said, as he was talking, as he was talking, I my mind was running. And so what I did was, this was a speculation is what it was. So what I did was my mind ran and I ran to find the text that would take care of the speculation because what he had been told was false. What he had been told was not true. And I was able to go to the word of God and listen what I was able to do. I was able to cast down that argument. You know why? Because why it might have sounded good, it was not sound because it was not the truth. You got to know the word of God. God, you blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he, dedita- he meditates day and night. What about the sinner, the scornful, of uh, the counsel of ungodly? They are contrary to God. And they have arguments that are contrary to God. They have a belief system that's contrary to God. So you got to know the word. You got to know what your belief system is supposed to be. Can you... Can you explain why you believe? Can you, somebody ask you why you believe. Can you explain why you believe? You got to know what you believe. And you got to know when the false comes so that you recognize it because you recognize it based on what you know and what you believe in the word of God. We got to be able to cast it down, those false ideas. Cast down everything that wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God and get you to go with that instead of what you know about God. You got to know it. Let me get through. Let me get through. Let me get through. Let me get through. He says, so we cast down, we cast down uh, everything. Uh, we cast down arguments and everything, high thing, high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Let me get through. Let me get through. Um, and then he says, then he says at the end of the verse, I want to quit here, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Here it is. Now this this is it. This is it. I got to discipline my mind and my thoughts. Bring every thought, everything that the enemy brings to you. It, it, every thought, everything that high exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He says that we've got to cast them down. Listen to this. Bringing every thought into captivity. Captivity. When you got a war, you have captives. Here it is captivity to obedience of Christ. Here it is. Here it is. The contrary thoughts are defeated by obedience to Christ. Or you could say, listen to this, listen to this. You could say my contrary thoughts because the enemy, and and listen to this. Many times, thank you, Jesus. When the enemy introduces something to your thoughts, to your mind, he don't want you to recognize they're from him. He wants them, you to think they're your own thoughts. Why isn't that something? He doesn't want you to recognize he's the one trying to plant the seed. He doesn't want you to recognize that he's the one trying to get you to go astray. That's why he inter- he introduces him as something good for you. Be good to you, good for you. So my my thought, my contrary thoughts, my contrary thoughts, what the enemy wants to introduce, are defeated by obedience to Christ. Now, again, I said you got to know the word. You got to know the word. You got to know the word. Okay, 
This is not the, a word that they keep the devil away. This is not a verse that they keep the devil away. You got to know. You got to know. So when the thing comes, you know what to do with it. See, here's the thing. When the, thing, when the thought comes, you got to know what to do with it. You don't want it lingering. You don't want it hanging around. You don't want it trying to expand your thinking to get deeper on it. You got to bring that thought into captivity. You, you got to capture that thing. You got to make it a prisoner. How do you make it a prisoner? By obeying Christ. But the thought wants you to walk out of God's will. When we obey Christ, we walk in his God's will. So when the thought comes, you got to recognize it and you got to take it captive and you got to do just the opposite of what the thought wants you to do and that's obeying Christ. The thought wants you to go one way. Christ says go this way. You got to go the way Christ wants you to go. That's how you bring the thought captive. That's why we often say you got to have a word for that stuff that's going on with you. You got to have a word for what the enemy is bringing against you. That's why we say you got to know yourself well enough. You got to know how the enemy comes against you. And when the enemy comes against you, you got to have, you got to have a, it is written so you can obey it is written. And that's how you bring that thought captive. Captive, you, you, you imprison it. You bring it captive and it don't get no probation time. It don't get no time off for good behavior when you get it and you capture it and you bring it into obedience to Christ because you don't want that thought ruling over your mind. You don't want that thought ruling over how you do your life. So you bring it into captivity. You capture it by obeying Christ. The enemy says, let's do this. And Christ says, no, that's not what I have you to do. So you listen to the word of God say what Christ says. The enemy says, say this about them. And you said, no, that's not how the word would have me to talk. The word says that I should let no corrupt communication come out of my mouth. So I capture that corrupt thought with knowing what the word of God says. And I capture it. I capture it. The, the enemy says you should be bitter and you should be hateful and you should be resentful. But the word of God says, I forgive. So in order to keep myself in the will of God, I forgive. Because when I forgive, that keeps bitterness and resentfulness and hatefulness from eating me up. You got to have a word to come against what the enemy brings against you so you can bring what the enemy brings against you into captivity and to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's how you capture that thought. So you, we got to obey. We got to obey. The enemy wants to capture your thoughts but you need the, so they can capture your mind, but you need to capture the thought that the enemy introduces by obedience to the word of God, by obedience, by obedience. That's how you see the victory. <laughs> That's how you see the overcoming life that God has already produced, pronounced over your life by obedience to him. Not by cooperating with the enemy, but obedience to Jesus Christ. That's how you see the victory manifested in your life. And so if you are living what you feel like is a defeated life, you could be feeling defeated because you're not obeying. I'm just saying. Because God did not leave you here to live a defeated life. He left you here to live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. And the way you live the victorious Christ in life, Jesus, is by obeying his word. We must obey. It's not about how I feel. It's not about how I think. It's about what God has said. What God has said. And so you bring that thought into captivity by obeying Christ. You bring those speculations, those things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God by obeying Christ, no matter how good it sounds, no matter what sense it might make, because in the natural, it might make sense, but in the spiritual, the devil wants to mess you up. He wants to mess you up. And let me tell you something. He works at it. He's good at what he does. He's determined, and you got to be more determined to do it God's way than the devil is to get you to do it his way. You bring those thoughts captive. Let me give you this last thing. Let me give you this last thing about the mind. I'm going to stop there. 
I'm going to stop there. Let me give you this last thing about the mind. You've heard it before. You've seen it before. We've talked about it before. We've talked about the mind a lot before. But in this spiritual warfare, we, we can't underestimate the devil attacking the mind. Here it is. We didn't say it before. Philippians 4 and 8. We didn't, we didn't talk about it before. We didn't, we didn't went through it before. Here it is again. Finally, brethren, <laughs> whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report. Listen to this. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, think, meditate on these things. So when the enemy, we told you before, this is like your sifter. Here it comes again. Somebody needs to catch this again. The word is your sifter. Y'all remember old school mama and grandma when you used to buy flour and they had to put it in a sifter to get it down fine because there was stuff in there that wasn't good for them to cook. So they put in that sifter and whatever stayed on the top of that screen of the sifter, they threw it out. They didn't want that getting into the, the bread or whatever they was going to make. So they threw that out. This is your sifter. This is a sifter for your thoughts. Here it is. A sifter for your thoughts. Spiritual sifter for your thoughts. If it don't fit, if it don't fit in verse 8, man, this is good. If it don't fit in verse 8, reject it. Reject it. Okay. Reject it. This is how you obey. You obey this. And we told you before, if, 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 if this is too complicated, if you can't learn this all, one, just think about the life of Jesus. Just think about Jesus. Because every one of these virtues, everything you hear, you see here is about Jesus Christ. If it don't fit what Jesus was about, then you reject it. Because it's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. If it don't fit how Jesus modeled and it, the lifestyle of a kingdom person and what we see in the Bible, then you got to reject it because it's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So we've got what we need. God has, God has equipped us with what we need. He's given us his word. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And we need to use what he has given us. Stop asking God for what he's already done. Use what God has already given you. He don't need to give you no more. He, what he's giving you right now is all that you need to see the victory in Christ Jesus that's already been granted you. But you got to obey. I've got to obey the word of God. We've got to stop. Listen, <laughs> let me go old school I'm going home we got to stop being hard-headed children we've got to be children's mom and them used to say would mind her y'all you remember boy you better mind me <laughs> we've got to start minding God <laughs> we got to start listening to the word and obeying the word and then we see the victory in Christ Jesus it comes by our old obedience Pray with me if you would. God, I, 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 we bless you tonight. I thank you for your word tonight. I pray that your word has enlightened our life. Our word, your word has made our life uh, plainer in what you've called us to do. And that's to obey you. That the enemy is coming. Uh, he, he wants to cause us to live contrary to you, God. But you've already given us what we need to see the victory in Christ Jesus. And we, we, we need to obey. We just need to say, yes, Lord, and not just yes, Lord, out of our lives. But God, I pray that we live a yes, Lord, life, a yes, Lord, lifestyle. And when the enemy tries to draw us away, that we say no to the enemy and yes to you. Bless you now for being so good and so kind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you. Thank you again for coming out and being with us on this Wednesday evening. Uh, hopefully something was said that's going to encourage you in your walk to take another look at your walk. Take a look, look at your priorities. The word helps us to build our priorities, but the priority needs to be saying yes to Jesus Christ. Walking in his will and walking in his way. Hopefully you'll be back with us Sunday morning at uh, 1130 a.m. We'll be back again bringing us a word from God out of the word of God. Enjoy the rest of your evening.